and um, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for, for, you know, for being here. Um, and I also have to, just a quick preamble. So um, I do some writing for uh, The New Republic. Um, and so I wrote the review of Black Panther, the movie, for The New Republic, right? So um, this talk is a more historical talk. Um, and so we're going to sort of take you through how we got to this moment. Um, but I am more than happy during the Q&A to talk about um, the movie and all the implications thereof. Um, so just, just, to, just to give you that, that clear sense. Um, and again, and, and as, as we are sort of giving thanks and being hopeful, we should, we should also thank uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, um, who created this, um, this character all those years ago, and also the ones who followed in their footsteps, Don McGregor, Christopher Priest, Reginald Hudlin, and ta Coates, right? Um, um, yes, so it was funny. He asked me um, several weeks before the movie was even out, hey, you want to come down to Villanova? And it seemed like a very low-stress thing to do. And now it's just like, oh, God, um, the movie, right? So, OK. So as Jelani Cobb notes in his review of, of Coogler's Black Panther in The New Yorker, quote, Africa is a creation of a white world and the literary, academic, cinematic, and political mechanisms that it used to give that mythology the credibility of truth. No such nation as Wakanda exists on the map of the continent, but that is entirely beside the point. Wakanda is no more or less imaginary than the Africa canonized in such Hollywood movies as Tarzan. So that's the end of the quote, right? Um, so given this reality, um, it's perhaps fitting that Black Panther owes his existence to two Jewish American creators. Um, and while the tradition of comics is to list the writer first, um, I'm going to invert that and say that Black Panther was created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, um, not because I've taken sides in the contentious debate around who deserves credit for what, um, but because I think that uh, Kirby's political vision is key to understanding the initial iteration of Wakanda. Um, while bo both Lee and Kirby are Jewish, Lee's assimilationist ethos um, produced everyman heroes like Peter Parker. Kirby's heroes, particularly those he created on his own or with collaborators other than Stan Lee, often embodied a resistance to the current political situation, right? And so um, here's the most famous uh, character that he creates. Um, um, that Jack Kirby creates, uh, um, you know, uh, Captain America, um, and of course, Captain America is punching Hitler. Um, and so, if people tell you that punching Nazis is not okay, um, you should refer to this comic and say, "But Captain America says it's okay." Um, um, and so, again, so it, well, what's important to note here is the, is the chronology that this comic debuts six months before Pearl Harbor which is to say that it debuts before America is officially at war, right? And so what we have is, is an imagining, like, like a, a speculative thing, a looking to the future, a hopeful looking as well, right? Um, we also have, and here's one of, that, that was young Jack Kirby early in his career. Here's later Jack Kirby. Um, and so if you guys were on Twitter and you heard that Ava DuVernay has been, um, her new project is gonna, is gonna be the new gods, well, this is Ava's new project, right? And so, um, you know, I think an epic for our time, Orion fights for Earth. This sense of having a grand mission that, that, that's greater than oneself, right? It's, this is Kirby's sensibility, and this is what Kirby bought um, to the Black Panther, right? And so, you know, in a lot of ways, and here's one of the, one of the great um, illustrations from his first appearance, um, in a lot of ways, uh, Kirby offers up a vision that anticipates the Afrofuturism that has come to define both the Black Pan Panther's visual aesthetic and people of African descent's creative engagement with fantasy. Um, by offering a techno-futuristic revision of, Af of Africa, um, the Black Panther's debut marks an important milestone, right? And so, and this is 19, this is Fantastic 452 um, in 1966. And so here we have him um, on the cover the first black hero um, in, the, in the sort of modern superhero age, right? Because he's the hero, uh, the Black Panther demands from his audience the same sort of sympathetic identification um, that, that we extend to Captain America or Batman or Superman. This not only provides audiences with an opportunity to align their sympathies with a black character, 
It also offers a corrective for African and African American audiences. Um, this would have far-reaching consequences as the movie's playing as is playing out right now. Um, but importantly, France Fanon notes in Black Skin, White Masks, quote, in the comic books, the wolf, the devil, the evil spirit, the bad man, the savage, are always symbolized by Negroes or Indians. Since there is always identification with the hero, the little Negro, quite as easily as the little white boy, becomes the explorer, the adventurer, the missionary, the colonizer, although he doesn't say colonizer. Um, that was Shuri. Um, who faces the danger of being eaten by the wicked Negro, right? So Fanan was writing about the comics that he encountered in his youth in Martinique, a Francophone Caribbean colony where he undoubtedly encountered not only French translations of Tarzan, but also, oh, oops, sorry, I meant to give you the quote so you could take a look at it. Um, but so when he, when he wrote this quote, though, he is, he is thinking about the comics that he encountered in, in his youth, which included not just Tarzan, but also included um, um, the misadventures of Tintin. And this is the famous Tintin in the Congo. Um, and so I'm, we're going to leave this behind, but I want to sort of let, set, set this up as this is what Black Panther is reacting to. This is what Black Panther is meant to be a corrective for, right? So um, with the Black Panther, Lee and Kirby create what the Cameroonian philosopher Achille Bembe might term an autonomous African subject. Um, and by complicating the, the perfidious stereotypes that were the norm, for much of popular culture in the 1960s, Lee and Kirby, or Kirby and Lee, created an icon whose fictive presence allowed the audience and creators who followed to connect him to a number of past, futures, and presents. Right? Um, so the Black Panther has been associated with Ethiopian resistance to Italian, Italian colonialism, uh, the Black Power movement, the Civil Rights movement, and Afrofuturistic figures like Sun Ra and Felu Kuti. Right? And so, He's this really plastic, open symbol that a lot of people can sort of find themselves in, right? OK. Um, but to turn to his original appearance, um, it, re it revolves around a device which is a cliche in superhero comics. Um, the heroes mistakenly fight each other before realizing that they're on the same side and then shifting over to fight the real enemy, right? Um, but Fantastic Four 52 puts a twist on this um, because it's not a mistake. Um, T'Challa summons the Fantastic Four in order to fight them, right? He's like, I'm bringing you here so that I can beat you up, right? Um, um, and this is meant to, again, as I've said several times, it's meant to sort of challenge the stereotypes about the possibilities of the African hero, right? Um, and so to return to this panel again, um, he is attracted, he, I'm sorry, uh, the leader of the Fantastic Four, Reed Richards, is attracted by, quote, an African chieftain called the Black Panther because of his access to futuristic technology, right? Um, ben Grimm, the thing, wonders, quote, how a refugee from a Tarzan movie laid his hands on this kind of tech, right? And so again, we have the, the stereotype, you know, sort of running into the reality. Um, and this is important. So Reed Richards says, OK, we're going to go to Wakanda. We're going to visit and see what's going on here. And he stops off at NYU to pick up um, the Human Torch, who at the time was enrolled in NYU. Um, and the Human Torch has a Native American roommate, Wyatt Wingfoot. right? And this is like a weird detail. But he says, hey, you want to come to Africa with us? It's like, um, you guys are a superhero team. Why are you bringing this civilian? But sure. So we have the Fantastic Four plus, their, plus Johnny Storm's Indian roommate. And they're all flying off to Wakanda. Right? Um, and so this is important because when they show up in Wakanda um, and they are ambushed by the Black Panther, he makes clear what he's trying to do, as he says here. Um, in any equal match, the Black Panther is certain to win. Right? So what he does is he isolates each of the members, and he challenges them one on one, and he uses his technology to neutralize their powers, to make them his equals. Right? So again, we have an African subject putting himself really elevating himself to be the equal of the founding family in the Marvel Universe, the Fantastic Four, right? Um, and so this is you know, really significant and really interesting and really important, right? Um, however, he didn't account for Wyatt Wingfoot, right? So he had all these things figured out. Um, and this is interesting as well, because I, I almost feel like Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had read Fanon, which they hadn't. 
Um, trust me, they hadn't. Um, because what they set up in, the, in this issue is a situation where the African and the Indian, if you, to go back to that quote, are the ones that sort of win, that win the day, right? And the superpowered, you know, pioneering scientist white people are easily defeated, right? And so it creates this really interesting tension, and we see it here. Um, you took every precaution against the greatest superpower team in the world, but you overlooked one factor. Sometimes a man with no superpowers can tip the scales for or against you, right? So if we think about the Fantastic Four as representing um, in sort of a double way, they represent both the um, post-World War II nuclear family, right? But they also represent sort of sci the, 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 the scientific innovation of the post-World War II moment. Um, this is, you know, a really important thing because what, it, what essentially this panel is saying is we need a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy in order to get the best out of who we are. Right, that if you take everything into account, but you don't take into account the African or the Indian, then th the job is not done. Right, um, and you're and you are woefully incomplete. Right, okay, um, which of course brings us to well, wait a minute, dude, did you just bring us over here to, to to beat us up and teach us a lesson? But of course, that's not why he brought them there. He brought them there in part because he is anticipating an invasion by claw. Right, um, not the South African claw of the movie, um, but um, a different figure. Um, and this invasion happens in the next issue. And so again, here we have for the second issue, issue in a row, we have the Black Panther on the cover of the most popular comic, um, the way it begins. Right. Okay. And so. Um, Having, having proven himself against a Fantastic Four, he is explaining to them who he is and what Wakanda is. And it's, of course, at this moment, um, because comic books are all about coincidence, it's at this moment that the claw launches his attack, right? Um, so the Fantastic Four engage Claw's mercenaries, preventing them from harming the Wakandan populace, while the Black Panther slips behind the, behind the front lines, confronts Claw, and cripples the machine powering his sonic weapon. So he essentially, the, the, the vibranium tech, he's able to go and disable it, right? Um, Despite his years of training and the panther powers that, that derive from the ingestion of the secret herbs, um, T'Challa defeats Claw essentially because, um, and he, as it says in the here, you do not realize I am a scientist too, right? Um, and so again, even at this moment, it's not his athletic ability, it's not his superpowers that, that enables him to win, it's his brain, right? Um, and so from the very beginning, the Black Panther had, had been designed to sort of reverse all the stereotypes, right? Um, um, and in fact, and so in an, in an interesting inversion, the pursuit of raw materials by a European colonizer led to the invasion of an African nation, but the scientific expertise granted in the, the African monarch the means to both attract powerful allies from the West and also the knowledge necessary to, to, to defeat his enemy, right? And so this is, you know, sort of the opposite of how the scramble for Africa sort of played out, right? Um, okay, so according to Ramsey Fawaz, um, Claw and the Black Panther fit into a common narrative dyad in comics that places into opposition scientists, right? So we have scientists with, quote, commitments to scientific, se to, to, to scientific self-interest um, engaged against those who embrace scientific cosmopolitanism, right? So in other words, scientists who are selfish and are seeking, like, <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> Um, who are seeking to use their tech to enrich themselves versus scientists who are seeking to use their technologies to sort of um, better all humankind, right? Um, and so, uh, again, Jack Kirby drives this home with his original depiction of Claw, right? Um, while Claw's attire here, um, so I'm sorry, despite clutching, um, a futuristic piece of Wakandan technology um, powered by vibranium, Claw seems more representative of the 19th century scramble for Africa that partitioned the continent according to the whims of European imperial powers than an avatar of post-World War II scientific innovation. Uh, while Claw's attire, if not his intentions towards the hidden African nation of Wakanda, might seem anachronistic, we must remember that comics embraces a kind of simultaneity that allows for incongruous concepts to exist alongside one another. The Avengers, for example, have a Norse deity, a World War II superhero, a Soviet-era super spy, and a sentient android among their members, right? It's like, how does this work, 
right? We have an android, that's futuristic. We have a Norse deity, that's from the past. We have someone from World War II and someone from the Soviet Union, neither of which exist anymore, but somehow they're all fighting together, right? But this is what comics do. Comics enable this kind of weird simultaneity, um, you know, and the Black Panther and also Claw fits right into this. So he's both meant to symbolize a 19th century figure and also a Cold War figure, right? Um, so the text on the page furthers this because it likens him to, quote, a greedy ivory hunter, even as Claw himself views his, quote, discovery of vibranium as confirmation of his pioneering genius, deepening the connections between his self-serving intentions and the colonial legacy of the Belgians. And he is originally a Belgian, right? And so if we know about King Leopold's ghost, and if you don't, you can ask your professors about that. I'm sure they're, they're happy to, to go into it for you. Um, this, is a, this is a really a, a, a doubling down, right? So constructing a narrative in this way, um, via an artful and, and intentional collapsing of the past and the present, defines the superhero genre and shapes the Black Panther from this first appearance, and also confirms Achille Bembe's assertion that, quote, African existence is neither a linear um, is neither a linear time nor a simple sequence in which each moment effaces, annuls, and replaces those that precede it. Indeed, according, uh, instead, according to Bembe, um, Africans live in a state of, quote, entanglement, where time is not a series, but an interlocking of, of presents, past, and futures that retain their depths, um, um, each age bearing, altering, and maintaining the previous one. While Bembe articulates this radical state of, of simultaneity in order to describe the oscillating and contradictory um, process by which a nation moves from being colonized to a period of decolonization to becoming a post-colony, this notion of entanglement um, also describes the sort of continuity of the, of, the, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right, where things are happening in a discontinuous way, and yet we're supposed to sort of, in our heads, place them in order. Right? So the first movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Iron Man. Right? The second movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Iron Man 2. The third movie is Captain America. So we begin in the present day, and then we take that a step further, and then the third movie brings us back to World War II. Right? So things are always already being told out of order and mixed up and backwards. Right? When, when we get to uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, for example, we are now in the 70s somehow. Right? So like we, we're, like, we're like constantly oscillating back and forth um, and trying to, and, and this is something that comics, um, and because of comics now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe just takes for granted that, you know, you guys have seen all the movies and you know how this stuff all fits together, even if we're putting it out in the wrong order and even if we're sort of going back and making changes along the way, you'll figure it out and you'll be entertained by the story, right? Um, so this is, this is a different kind of entanglement, but I think it works in a similar way, right? Okay, so, um, <laughs> With his nation secure, T'Challa thanks the Fantastic Four um, and essentially says, okay, now I'm going to go back to like, ruling Wakanda again. Thanks for your help, guys. Um, and they literally push him out into the world, right? As it says, oh, I'm sorry, that's not the, that's not the one I want. I'm going backwards. This is the one I want. Um, there's no reason for the Black Panther's career to come to an end. The world will always have need of a dedicated, powerful fighter against injustice, right? This is one of the, one of the, the better changes the movie makes, right? Where T'Challa's embrace of the world doesn't come at the insistence of a bunch of white people saying, hey, no, do more, right? It actually comes organically from within, right? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But what he says here, I shall do it. I pledge my fortune, my power, my very life to the service of all mankind, right? Um, again, this is, this is a very sort of United Nations ethos, you know, um, nation states pledging resources to the service of all mankind, right? And so he's fitting in to this, to, into the logic of the Cold War, right? Um, and let me make sure I'm going the right way. Am I going the right way? Yes, I am, okay. Um, and so again, what we see here, um, I'm just coming back to this image because I think this image is really important for how it establishes, literally establishes visually his superiority. He towers over the Fantastic Four. They are shrunken down. Um, but, more, but more importantly, thank you. Um, more importantly, it also establishes um, the importance of the Native American as well, right? So we have you know, we have the white nuclear family, but we also have the model minorities who are meant to sort of um, serve as proof that the post-World War II American liberal project is actually working. 
Okay, so uh, the events of these two issues established Black Panther as a citizen of the world willing to place his obligations to mankind above his need to, to protect Wakanda. Um, but unfortunately, over the next 20 years, um, much of this um, innovation and incentiveness is lost, right? Um, and so people wonder, like, what took, so, what, what took them so long to get around to a Black Panther movie? Um, it's because a lot of the Black Panther stories are kind of trash. Um, and unfortunately, well, because I'm a little perverse, we're going to go into one of those now, um, <laughs> right? And so um, if we want to understand what a triumph the movie is and, 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 and how it really has changed things, we, we should attend to this, right? Um, so one example of the retreat from the original sort of innovative groundbreaking work um, by Lee and Kirby is Fantastic Four 119, which um, displays a retrograde understanding of both international and American race relations. Cynically exploits T'Challa's status as an African subject, as well as Bing Grimm's status as a working class hero in the hopes of saying something important about race. Written by Roy Thomas and illustrated by John Basima, the story takes place in Rudyardia. Um, a fictionalized uh, version of South Africa named after the English poet, novelist, and colonizer Rudyard Kipling. And he literally was a colonizer. Good old Kipling. Um, uh, the entire, he helped colonize India, if, if you're curious. Uh, the entire issue serves as a ham-fisted exercise in consciousness raising at the expense of T'Challa's agency and humanity. Right? Um, so T'Challa's been taken, taken prisoner. Um, and it's like, well, how? I mean, we've all seen the Black Panther. How could any regular people take him prisoner? But we'll just we'll forget about that. Um, and um, one of his um, one of his uh, one of his aides um, um, and wow, what's his name? Because this is um, I just blanked on his name. Um, 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 the actor from Get Out played him in the movie. Wakabi, right? So this is Wakabi reaching out and basically saying. Um, you know, hey, he's been taken prisoner, um, but they don't realize that the Black Panther is also the head of state. They think that he is, you know, sort of like people don't realize that, that you know, that Peter Parker and Spider-Man are the same person. They don't realize that, like, the, that the head of Wakanda, the, the, the head of the nation, is also Black Panther. So while they have him prisoner, we can't demand his return or we'd be essentially blowing his cover, right? Um, and so it's like, yeah, but you guys, you know, this is, this is Ben Grimm. He says, you know, why don't you guys, you guys are Wakandan. You're awesome. Why don't you just go in there and take him back? And he says, uh, that nation is one of the last reigning strongholds of white supremacy on our continent. One of my color can function there only with difficulty. Oh, yeah, I read about that place, but I forgot, right? Um, and so this is, as far as I can tell, the first time white supremacy is mentioned in any comic book. Um, but that's probably the only good thing about this panel, um, because Ben Grimm's um, attitude is, is, is one of a typical liberal subject. Um, oh, yeah, other people are, go are being discriminated against, but it's not really affecting me, so, you know. Um, and so, but of course, um, Reed is like, look, I'm doing a scientific experiment over here. Ben, can you and Johnny go, right? And so instead of bringing a person of color like Wyatt Wingfoot, you have the two white men who decide to go to South Africa, I'm sorry, Rudyardia, um, to free him, right? Um, but of course, uh, the thing who's famous in America, he's a superhero, he discovers that he can't get a cab when he, when he shows up there. This is like super heavy handed stuff, right? Um, and again, um, we have the, the uh, um, you know, his woke bro, uh, Johnny Storm, saying maybe, maybe a black man trying to, get, trying to get to Harlem, right? So just reminding him of that, like what he's facing now was what black Americans face all the time, right? Um, so he, he finally like literally stops, a, stops the car with his hand and their suspicions are confirmed when he says, say, I know you, you're the thing, one of the American Fantastic Four, hop in, sir. Sorry, I didn't stop at first, but I took you for, I mean, I mean, just take us where, where we tell you, fella, and shut your yap before I get sick, right? Um, and so again, this is one of several instances where um, the Fantastic Four are willing to go along with white supremacy and racism to complete the mission, right? And it's not about actually understanding what's going on. It's just about getting their friend out of jail. And we see this here when they arrive in the prison, and someone says, free me, I'm a political prisoner. And of course, this is South Africa in 1974, right? So they're probably all political prisoners. But of course, what does he say? I don't like this jail. Oh, not, I'm sorry, that's, that's Johnny Storm. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Wish I had time to find out, 
but like the man said, we're in a hurry, right? And so again, what we have here is we have the privileged African monarch who is treated one way, and then we have all the other African citizens being treated a different way, right? Um, so, and this is for me hilarious because when they free him, um, because of course they free him, and he's putting on his costume and about to finish his original mission, which is to get back some vibranium. It's always about the vibranium. Um, um, he says, hey, um, how come you called yourself Black Leopard back there instead of the Panther? Now, I'm going to reiterate that this is 1974 when this book was, when this comic book was published. He says, I contemplate a return to your country, Ben, where the latter term, Black Panther, has political connotations. I neither condemn nor condone those who have taken up the name, but T'Challa is a law unto himself, right? And this for me is f both fascinating and telling um, because essentially what you have is you have, you have an African subject saying, if I align myself too closely to a militant black American movement, I will not be allowed to return to, to America, right? Um, and so again, like they're coming here to free this man from a racist society, but in the course of freeing them, they've essentially indicted America as being equally as racist, right? Because why is he in jail in the first place, right? The same reason he might not be allowed to come back. Um, so again, anyway, so they find the, they find the vibranium, um, and um, during the course of their adventure, they are, you know, they're confronted with stuff like this, right? Beautiful, you break your back saving the whole goddamn world, and then you gotta walk out through separate but equal doors. Um, and Johnny Storm kind of makes you wonder if it was worth it, huh? Right? So Ben Grimm, using his strength, destroys the separate but equal, right? It's like, okay, yes, this is a good moment here. Um, and yet, <laughs> there, you know, somehow I feel a little bit better about everything now. Not much, though. Ben, I, I don't know how to forget it, T'Challa. I didn't do that for you. I did it for me. Right? So it's like, so wait, why then are you here if not to actually confront white supremacy? It's just to make myself feel better, right? Um, and so this is the way T'Challa was used a lot, um, a lot, a lot during, um, during the sort of wilderness era from the, from the mid-1970s into the 1990s, where he was used strictly as a, a cipher, a foil for other people's, you know, sensibility, right? Um, and that changed with Christopher Priest, who I'm not going to go into. It also changed with, um, with Reginald Hudlin and finally with ta Coates. And a lot of their ideas are the ideas that show up in the movie. Um, but I want to focus in particular on this story here. Um, and I like this story because it, it almost serves to negate the other story. This story is not about T'Challa or even his father T'Chaka, but about his grandfather who in this sort of retcon story in this entangled story fights alongside Captain America during World War II, right? Um, so again, we all know, or I hope we all know, that um, the German General Rommel um, invaded Africa during World War II, um, and that there, so there was a front in Africa, right? So um, what's happening here in this story is that, of course, why would the Germans invade Africa? For what? Oh, well, duh. What are they looking for? Say it together now. Vibranium, right? And so they, they, they sort of tie this in. And so, of course, when the US government figures out what's going on, they have to send Captain America because, God, if Hitler gets a vibranium, you know, the war is going to be over, right? Um, and so, but for me, what's interesting, and this, is, and this is, I think, one of the earlier iterations of Eric Killmonger, is they send Captain America with an elite squad of, of soldiers called the Howling Commandos, right? Um, and now it's important, because during World War II, the, the, the military was segregated. But um, because this is the elite squad, they took the best from each of the units. And so um, this is, this is um, Gabe Jones from Harlem. And Gabe is, um, you know, he played in um, James Europe's band. Um, they actually referenced James Europe because this is being written by Reginald Hudlin. Um, and so he's, so that's why he's got the bugle there. Um, but this story is told from the point of view of an American seeing Wakanda for the first time, right? Um, but his commanding officer gives him um, a double mission, right? And that's, that's, that's his commanding officer. Um, and his double mission is, he says, we need the firepower to protect people who don't think they need the help. Because if the Nazis get, to, uh, get their hands on what's here, it's over for the whole world. What are you asking me to do? Find the vibranium. That's what the Nazis are here for. We've got to get to it first, 
right? Um, and so again, we have this, the sort of the strength of American um, uh, diversity on display, right? Because, oh, we happen to have a, have a black American member of our crew. Well, we're going to leave you behind while we go help Captain America fight the Nazis. Your job, because you're black, is to infiltrate this society and find the vibranium. Right? And of course, this puts Gabe into a position of conflict. And I'm the perfect guy to steal some sacred rocks from the natives. The rest of the howling commando, the howlers, the rest of the howlers are going to back into the jungle to find the German camp. If the Wakandans liked Reb, Reb is this redneck southern guy, um, and, and Reb and Gabe have this weird friendship, even though like, one is from the south and one is from Harlem. Um, if the Wakandans liked Reb more than you, I'd give this assignment to him. Right? So the commanding officer here is just being completely pragmatic. Right? Um, we're here, we're the good guys, and you're the right hues for the job, so please do the job. Right? Um, saving lives can be a dirty business. Right? Um, and so again, you know, what does he say here? You can count on me, sir. Right? So in the moment, he puts his duty as, an, as a soldier above whatever affiliation he might have with these people. Of course, it doesn't last very long. Um, because when he gets to Wakanda, and I'll let you guys read this for yourself, this is what, he, uh, this is what he's thinking, right? And again, this is, you know, if, if, if you can see it, heaven, I've never seen anything like this, right? Um, so, you know, just the look on, the, the look on his face. Um, and again, so this is 1942, roughly, when Rama would have invaded. So this is f way before uh, the civil rights movement or any sort of social mobility for blacks in America. And so for him to see this autonomous black state, um, I mean, as we know, the whole world wants to see this now. It's, it's the number one movie in the world for like a month. Um, he is quite taken by this, right? Um, so later on in this adventure, skipping over a whole bunch of stuff, he, of course, because he's close to the king, he actually winds up saving his son's life. So that would be T'Chaka, the one who dies later on, who Claw kills. He, he this black American, saves his life. In exchange for this, he offers um, Azuri, this will be T'Challa's grandfather, offers him citizenship. He says, hey, you've done us a great service. Um, we know, because we have spies everywhere, how bad it is for black people in America. You're free to stay if you want to stay, right? And his answer is, again, interesting if we think about the post-war American project. It's not that I don't appreciate the offer of citizenship. But even if I lived here, I'd still want to fight this fight. And again, this, this is protecting Wakanda from outsiders. Um, and when I got home, I, I got to fight that fight too. Right? So he's like, look, I, you know, I'll protect you, and I have protected you, but I got to go home and fight to make my world, my place, America, better. Right? Fair enough. Remember, if you need me, I will be there. Um, and he says, thanks. Right? But again, as he's on the plane going back home, he gets confronted um, by, the, um, uh, by his commanding officer. And he said, whatever happened to the vibranium? We just need a sample of it. You couldn't get any of it? And he's like, um, I don't believe you. You were too good. You were in too good. Sorry, Nick, um, but those are the facts. Right? He says, here, maybe you're not clear where your loyalties are. Want to stay in paradise? So this is important because he, the commanding officer didn't understand that he's already turned down the offer, right? So this is, it's, it, it's important. So he's having a personal conversation with Azuri. Hey, citizenship for you if you want it. Nope, I would rather go back to America and, and, and fight to make America a better place. But when he doesn't produce the African artifact, um, he's confronted with this idea, well, hey, if, you, if, if you're not happy in America, we can leave you behind. Um, not realizing that he's already made the choice, right? Um, and he says here, um, I do which is to say, I do want to stay in Wakanda. I mean, I want to stay in Wakanda. <laughs> Can you all go to Wakanda? Um, I do, but I'm here anyway. If that's not good enough for you, let me know now. Right? Um, and so for me, this is, um, this is the central conundrum of both uh, Black Panther, black superheroes, and also ultimately what Ryan Coogler sort of seized upon in constructing Eric Killmonger. This tension between wanting to, be, to belong to um, this idyllic and, and unspoiled African place that might not even exist versus sort of engaging in the struggle where you are today, right? And so just to repeat, if that's not good enough for you, let me know now. Um, 
And the response is, fair enough. Um, and this is how this comic book ends, um, Flags of Our Father. Um, and this is actually where I'm also going to end the talk. Um, so we can, we can have a, 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 a more uh, egalitarian conversation about all of these issues. So, thank you. So again, just trying to tie in the history of some of these things to what, um, you know, to what we're all sort of obsessed with now, which is this movie. It's only, it's only the third movie to be number one five weeks in a row. Um, and so, fingers crossed for six weeks in a row. Um, anyway, so any questions? About, not about this, if you don't have questions about this, about the movie as well. I'm, I can talk about all of it um, or none of it. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Just spoiler alert. Sorry, no. Has everyone seen Black Panther? Nah. What? <laughs> Bruh! <laughs> okay. All right. So, spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> no. We're going to ride now. Okay. So, so yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a funny thing, right? Because um, I'm going to talk about it in a very roundabout way. Um, so people have been very critical of ta Coates for Between the World and Me. Um, it's, oh, it's a great book, but how come he ignores black women? And how come he doesn't do more for black women? Um, the Dora Milaje were created by ta um, they existed before, but they were consorts. They were, it was like a stable right, of women that he would pick from to accompany him to like UN things. And they were spies. So there was, they had a little bit of Nakia in them, but they were mostly just eye candy or arm candy. Right? So ta innovation was to take them and say, no, 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 no. If you're going to have a crew of women, they would be badass women. Um, and so he sort of rewrote them as these um, you know, as essentially the FBI slash Secret Service of Wakanda, and that's what they are. And so he's, he, he took the little bit of spying that they would do as they're falling out of their cocktail dresses prior, and he turned it all the way up to 11 and sort of really, um, you know, turned them into really feminist icons, right? Um, and so I think that, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important moment, but it's surrounded by a bunch of other important moments, right? Um, T'Challa is, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, because he was the guy who was created in 1966, he's the main character. But if you remove him from the story, all of the other important characters are black women, right? Okoye, Shuri, Nakia, Ramonda, right? One of the things that drives me crazy is people say, oh, well, he, he agreed with Killmonger at the end. No, he didn't. He agreed with Nakia at the end. Nikki is the one who's going to Boko Haram when we meet her, right? And she's going to get all the way to the base where they are and free all the women, not just this, this one truck of women, right? Um, Nikki, who after the funeral and after the, the ceremony says, well, no, I cannot stay here. I've got to go back into the world, right? Because I'm committed to making the world a better place. And at the end, he says, I think I found a way for you to be, essentially be my queen, but also feel good about, about what we're doing as a, as a country, right? Um, so yes, yeah, so I think you know, there are all these moments that reverberate where um, you know, women are at the center, right? And so, I mean, for me, it's of course, um, you know, would you, you know, would you kill me, my love? And she was just like, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. It's like, you know, I'm not Rose, anyway. You know, um, he has the keys, but you know, look what he did. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, no, no, I, so, and, so, and so I think, again, um, one, of the, one of the strengths of the movie is the way that, that it, re it really sort of hues very closely to the original, like Stanley Jack Kirby vision, um, but also updates it in a lot of really important ways. And I think, that, that, I think that that's definitely one of them. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, do you think Um, yeah. So, so the important thing is, is we, the movie opens with that montage, 
where the little boy's like, tell me the story. That little boy is Killmonger at the very, at the very beginning, and it's his father in exile telling him the story of this place he's never seen before, right? Um, and again, I think, and I wrote this in, in my review, um, that you know, people like Marcus Garvey posited that um, like, you know, black people living in the Americas, so living in Trinidad, living in Guyana, living in Jamaica, living in Harlem, were bereft. We were missing something because we didn't have this connection with our brothers across, across the sea. And so this is that connection sort of just really you know, turned up a little bit, right? Um, and people are like, oh, they, they could have given him, I'm like, it's a superhero movie. Right? Like, I, I appreciate that your frustration that you wanted those themes to be explored with more subtlety or, or but I thought that, I mean, one, I think that it, they're explored very well. Um, but ultimately, the Black Panther has to win. Like, you know, like, that's just how it works. Like, oh, the Joker has a point. Okay, so then Batman dies and the Joker, no, that's, that's not how this works. Right? Um, and so, but yeah, no, I mean, I think Kugler does a great job of really getting at um, that, that tension between Africans and African Americans, right? The people who were colonized in one way and the people who have this connection to the, to the land in a way, you know, that, that someone like me, I can't have that connection, right? You know, I'm born in America, I grew up here. Um, you know, my people go back to the Caribbean, but, that, but even the Caribbean is once removed because then when you go to the Caribbean, you gotta go back across the ocean, right? So, so many, you know, layers removed. So yeah, no, I, I mean, and I think it's also significant that there's no mother, mm -hmm. right? There's no mother and all of the violence he does, aside from beating up T'Challa, all the other violence he does is mostly is to women. He kills the curator. He kills his girlfriend. He kills the Dora Milaje. Like, yo, you killed the Dora Milaje. Like, that's for, like, you know, you're wrong. You killed the Dora, you killed the Dora Milaje. Like, and even the woman who was tending the sacred grove, Right, so it's like, oh, tradition, the thing that, this is, this is literally the thing that, has, that we've lost, right? And, it's, and he's just like, burn it, you know? It's just like, ugh, you know? So um, I think Kugler does a great job of sort of showing, you know, that tension. Um, and also I think that people are under, 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 they're not giving full enough thought to the fact that he is also a product of the, of the CIA. Right, so he's also been trained in a particular kind of way. You're not just gonna over, like when he says, look at all the people I've killed just to get to you. Like you're not gonna over, you know, just shake that off. Like th that's not gonna happen. That, that, that marks and defines him. That makes him unfit, even as it allows him to get to the throne. Right, before he gets to the throne, he's unfit for, to rule because he's the, pro the product of this, you know, of this thing, so. Mm -hmm. their, their interaction with uh, women. Yeah. But I wanted to talk, speak about um, the Don McGregor's run on Jungle Act. Of course. Um, a little bit. Now, I, I know that um, Reggie Butler uh, did a, a lot of that story, but the film on it. Yes, it did. That's when, I mean, that, that was an important break between yeah. you know, the Jack Kirby, and, and I think that's when he started to become less of a cipher. Right. Right, right, yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't talk. <laughs> I can't, I can't, you know. So, so for, for, for the rest of you, um, Jungle Action um, comes out in the, in, the, in the 70s, and it's this hippie dude named Don McGregor working with, oh, what's, oh, what's, what's the artist? Um, so it was the, no, no, no. It was the first black artist work, to work at Marvel. Um, and so it was funny, so because McGregor used to live on the upper upper west side. He used to live on like 86th, and um, uh, Graham, Billy Graham, but not the Reverend. Billy Graham used to live in Harlem, and they used to come and meet at 96th Street in a cafe, and they would sit in the cafe at a table and just do the whole thing, right? And so people, you could walk in and watch them doing the uh, putting together a Black Panther comic right there. No one did because it was 1975. Um, but yeah, your question about them. Oh, or just a comment? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. So, um, and so that's the that's the first place where we meet we meet Mbaku, right? Um, you know, you cannot talk anyway. Um, that's the first place where we where we meet Mbaku. Although he is like this like black exploitation like. And so for me, I was, that was the thing I was terrified about when I was reading about the the film, and they were like, oh, and Winston Duke will be playing Mbaku. I'm like. <gasps> Like, they cast M'Baku? Like, because he was such a stereotypical figure. Um, but, of course, 
you know, um, Ryan Coogler did, you just completely rehabilitated him. And um, do you guys have Omega Sci-Fi on this campus? You don't have cues? So I went to Howard. Um, and Howard is alpha chapter of, of Omega Sci-Fi. Um, and I just, I can't, I can't wait because they're all going to be like, we are the Jabari. I can just, because that's how, like, if you, know, if you know who the cues are, you know that they're going to take that iconography. Say, say it again. Oh, yeah. So you know what they're going to do. They're going to be, anyway. Um, go ahead. OK, right. And so, and so for me, it was, it was really sort of interesting to see how um, you know, even a character that was, I mean, if I showed you the original um, Mbaku, you guys would be like, that's racist. That's like, eh, that's, but like Donald Trump would have been like, that's an awesome image. <laughs> you know? um, but it shows you how respect for the source material and sort of intentionality can turn something that is you know, problematic into something that is, I mean, he's one of the biggest stars coming out of the movie, right? He was an unknown before this, and now he's getting movie offers left and right, which I'm happy for that dude. But yeah, no, so McGregor's, McGregor is really important. And, and this is from a, from a book chapter, and I, I spend a chunk of time talking about McGregor laying out these, you know, these things. So, yeah. Yes? Uh oh. Um, you know, I think um, I saw a really funny tweet where you saw you know the you know the you know the tweet I'm talking. Well, there's there's a really funny tweet. Someone said, "If you don't like being called a colonizer, you just understand I'm using it with an A, not an ER. I'm calling you colonizer, <laughs> not colonizer, right? Um, and so, but yeah, so and so for me, so I okay, so. I saw the film on February 4th, because I'm a film critic, and so I got to go see it, right? Um, and it was, and, and it, was, it was terrible, because you're in the dark, like with a notebook like this, and you're trying to take notes, and so like, this is really good, but I couldn't really even enjoy it. And, and I'm sorry, to, and we're all doing that, because Marvel was like, okay, give us, give us your cell phone, give us your, like, you, no bootlegging is happening, like, no, like, iPad, nothing, you're gonna write on pen and paper. And so we're all sitting in the dark writing, and even in the midst of trying to get everything right, she's like, hmm, colonizer, and everyone started laughing. These are movie critics, right? These people, we write about this for this is what we do. We all just burst out laughing, right? So um, I think on the one hand, it's, it, it speaks to the critical engagement, right? The idea that, um, like, how do we talk about the people who are engaged in structural violence against other people. Like, how do we describe the people who are breaking up families to send you know, a 40-year-old father back home to El Salvador? He's been in this country since he was four years old, right? It's like, how do we, you know, so I think the, the fact that it's sort of gone viral and people are now doing that, I think it speaks to that moment, right? Because people aren't walking around saying every white person's a colonizer. That's not what's happening. Right? It's just like when someone says something sort of rude and offensive, you're like, oh, chill, colonizer. Like you're, it's a way to push back against you know, that thing. It's like you're, you're, you, have a, you have like a Make America Great hat on. It's like, oh, colonizer. Right? It's like it's, it's a sort of in-joke. Right? Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, there's, a, there's a, he's now, it's, all, it's his own fault. But he's now disgraced. But there's a comedian, Louis C.K., who is, ugh. Um, but Louis C.K. Had, had a really great stand-up where he says, um, he says, you can't even insult, he's like, I'm a white and I'm a man. You can't even hurt my feelings. What are you gonna do, call me cracker? Oh, you're reminding me back when I owned land and people. Like, you know, like he was just talking about how, I mean, it, it's a joke and if you watch the clip on YouTube, you'll laugh. But he's speaking to how, you know, the language can't even hurt him as a white man, right? And so I think colonizer, in an interesting way, is sort of a thing that now, it's the same sort of, sling. Um, so not necessarily a good thing, but I think sadly a necessary thing for where we are right now, you know? Yeah. So, yes, brother. What happens when um, that same scene is colonized? Mm -hmm. This is from one of the critiques from, I guess, from moderate to left. Mm-hmm. Moderate to black to left. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So the colonizer is key to saving what kind? Okay, so here's the thing. 
Um, I've been talking a lot about and showing you guys a lot of source material, right? Because it's like it's important if you want to think about this this movie, you gotta you gotta like know the history, right? So in the comic books, the CIA agent ultimately declares his allegiance to Wakanda. So the, the the guy Ross, played by Martin Freeman, in the comic books, he becomes a double agent where he is working for Wakanda. He's in, you know, the US government sort of sending text messages back to T'Challa, letting him know what's going on, right? And so people are like, oh my god, I can't believe, like he, I'm like, first of all, what role did he play, right? In the middle of the fight, Shuri is like, wait, what do you need? And she ducks and ducks, okay, do this and do that. Like she's literally directing him in the fight. It's not like he's like, he's, well, why does he even have to be there? Well, he's part of the, you know, like M'Baku, he's part of the history of the character. And so, you know, he's, so I mean, I think, the people who are, who are making that, that critique and are complaining about um, that character are, one, ignorant of the source material. But two, even if you go back to the movies, because we first see that character in Age of Ultron, right? Um, and if you've seen Age of Ultron, and then he's filled up again in Captain America's Civil War. And in those films, he's incredibly competent. He's, he's, he's got all this authority. And when we first meet him in the casino, he's got the same, he comes in and he's like, no, you're not taking claw from me, and he's got that, all that authority. By the end of the movie, he's a joke, right? So if you watch like Civil War, and look at him in Civil War, if you watch him in the casino scene, and then you watch like what, what the film does to him is it reduces American authority to a joke, to something that's not threatening at all, right? Um, and, and again, and I think this is why it's important that unlike in the original where you have, you have the Fantastic Four pushing him, oh, you must go and like, help us save the world, he is confronting his ancestors. You know, because hey, Killmonger has confronted me, but also more importantly, the woman I love has confronted me about Wakanda's role in the world. And when he says, how come you didn't bring him home, him being Eric Killmonger, um, he's, you were wrong. Right? And that's the moment, right? Um, it's not about the CIA at all, right? He could have died on the, on the operating table, of course, not because sure he's a genius, but he could have died on the operating table and he still would have gotten to that moment where he's standing up in front of the, of the UN giving the, you know, giving the talk, right? So, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, little, and it's, a, it's a little ahistorical, right? Um, okay. Wait, 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 don't, don't close. Nope, we got one more. No, 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 no. He he got to have last word. You know how that goes. But so you're gonna go. Okay. So the black youth one is easier. Um, so when Indiana Jones came out, um, there was an uptick in people interested in archaeology. When Jurassic Park came out, there was an uptick in people interested in dinosaur paleontology, that's what it's like, in dinosaur studies, um, in, in paleontology, right? Um, um, oh, when, um, when Hunger Game and um, uh, the redhead Pixar, Brave, right? When Hunger Game and Brave came out like within six weeks of each other, and all of a sudden there were all these people signing up for archery classes. I'm sure the archery people were like, what the hell? Like, all of a sudden, we don't have any space for archery classes anymore. Right, so um, I think that Shuri, because she's a teenage girl, and also because she's fresh to death, like her, like every scene, she's got a different outfit on, and she's like iconically styled. Um, I think it is going to signify um, for a bunch of little girls, girls of color, but just girls in general, because girls are told they can't do science. I think it is going to what Shuri did it, right? Um, and so I'm really looking forward to you know to, to that as well. Um, Black Lives Matter is interesting because, well, let me, let me, let me say this. Um, it's easier to dismiss the concerns of a community if you don't take the humanity of that community seriously, right? Um, and one of the things I love about the depiction of, you know, of Wakanda is that you got, like, it was sort of incredible. It's like you got as, as much world building in two and a half hours as, like, two seasons of Game of Thrones, right? Um, it's like, you know, think of how much more time it took, right? Um, and so I was just looking this morning, because um, the movie opened in Korea and Japan and, um, and China last week. So I was looking at some Koreans, and this one Korean guy was on YouTube 
Um, and he was like, yeah, you know, the only thing we've ever seen before is black Americans are thugs and Africans are slaves. So this movie was really opened my eyes and it's like makes me think differently about what it is. So it's like, like that's to me important to sort of get people to, to you know, because now I can see your humanity. Because before you were these two stereotypes and now I see that you're more than that. And it's like, oh wow, I never thought about the fact that there's even a relationship between, you know, blacks in the West and, you know, the continent. And that it's this vexed thing. And it's like, oh wow, that's interesting. And it reminds me of, right? Um, there is a Chinese diaspora, for example. You know, I mean, there's a reason there's Chinatowns everywhere, right? Um, and so one of the things I've, I've also seen is that a bunch of Chinese people are like, oh, we never thought of Africa having a similar kind of thing where when you're living, you know, so for example, there, there are about a million, a little less, little less than a million Chinese people who live in Jamaica. Um, and so in fact, in fact the, um, the number one supermarket chain in Jamaica is owned and run by a Chinese family. Right? No, seriously. Um, but that family, when they go, and they have their connections back to where they're from in China, but when they go back, they're, they're essentially called niggers, right? Because they're from Jamaica, right? And it's like, oh, wow, we never thought that, you know, we have those kind of connections back and forth, but we never thought that Africans and African Americans had similarly tense relationships, right? And so again, it's, a, it's allowing people to see something different. So I think, I think it will ultimately, um, help, although it's, it's always difficult to pin that stuff down. So, okay. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I'm well, hey. And, uh, and this is just, this is just sort of tangential and pretty silly, but my husband and I mm -hmm. were talking about how we sort of, I guess it's because of our age, but we were thinking that, that this is like this generation mm -hmm. coming to America. I would yeah. argue. I would argue differently. I would argue it's this generation's Star Wars. So, no, I totally get that. Yeah. From that, yeah. From that yeah. genre. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But I'm just sort of thinking about, I guess we were thinking about right. I see what you're saying. how we love with these black people we were. Right. Right. And the way we felt. I mean, and I, the genres are completely different. Coming to America is a comedy and all that. Right. But I just remember how in love I was with these gorgeous black people. People. Right, right, and then Busta Rhymes did it in, in his in a music video, right? Yeah, yeah he like reprised that, right? Um, just even even maybe not. I mean, well, no, I mean I think ultimately the problem is is that Coming to America was a very successful independent black film. It wasn't like right now um, it's on pace to be fourth. You know, mm -hmm. it's 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 it'll be Avatar. Titanic, Star Wars, Black Panther. Like, the, like right now, that's where, that's where it's gonna end up, right? So Coming to America did well, but it's, it's very niche, right? right? Um, and so we really haven't had, I mean, arguably, the, like the last time, but again, um, okay, so arguably the last time we had this sort of splash was Roots where like everyone was talking about it and that was, you know, I was like two years old when Roots came out, right? I don't even remember Roots. But, um, but the important thing there though is, is, that you, you, is that there's black talent behind the camera, yeah. right? Because Roots, that was a decision made by, you know, essentially by white Hollywood to buy this best-selling thing and turn it into a miniseries. And it was a sensation, it was a phenomenon, right? But there was no follow-up, right? But Ryan Coogler's 31 years old. This is his third film, right? He did Fruitvale Station. Fruitville Station cost $1.5 million, made $20 million. He did Creed. Creed cost $80 million to make, and half of that went just, was just paying Stallone. Um, but Creed cost $80 million to make, made $600 million. And now he's done Black Panther. Black Panther is $175 million, and it's like $1.4 billion and counting right now. So he literally can do whatever he wants. Right, and so I think this, and so just to go back to Mbaku for a second, the actor who plays him, who literally was a background guy, like he had, he, you know, this is his biggest role by far. Um, so The Rock makes three movies a year, every year. Um, but if you think about The Rock's movies, none of his movies ever deal with race, right? But what's happening is people write scripts for The Rock where they're like, oh, and it all hinges because you're a black guy. And he's like, oh, I'll pass. But this is a good script, oh my God, what's gonna, hey, Mbaku. 
<laughs> and so he's getting like a lot of really good scripts because, oh, we need someone who's six foot five, check. Who's really muscular and athletic, check. Who's hilarious, check. Oh my. So, I mean, so, you know, this is changing a lot because, you know, it's like every single person in that movie is now bankable in a way that, I mean, Eddie Murphy was bankable, but no one else was bankable. Actually, I was just thinking, Yeah. No, of course, no, I, I get it. But it's just, it's, it's, no one in Korea, no one in Korea was, was, yeah. And, and more importantly, no one in Nigeria. Right, and like that's the thing, like the biggest, the biggest premiere, like it premiered, like I saw it on the 4th, it premiered on the, on the 5th, like the Hollywood thing, but then the day that the film was dropping here, that they were all in Nigeria. But Nigeria is the fourth, why wouldn't they be? The, the, it's the fourth biggest movie place in the world. Bollywood, Hollywood, Hong Kong, Nollywood, right? So why wouldn't they be in the fourth biggest place in the world? And it was a sensation there, right? So. That's to me what's what's different. Where you know it's it's this, you know it's this international language. Um, Two questions. Yes. Yes. Oh no no no! It's it's now opened everywhere. Oh, you know it's funny because on I can look on their Insta, but yeah, they've. It's funny how um, at one point, and I think he's happy about this. At one point, um um um. Um, ah, good lord, Chad. So at one point, Chad suddenly drops out, and Winston Duke, the actor who plays in Baku, took his place. He's like, "Dude, you're popular. You can go. You can go for me." You know. So he's because he's like having to, to hop the world to go all these places. But you know, it, they went. There was one. There was a. There was Japan, Korea. They didn't do Hong Kong. I think they did Beijing. Um, they did. They did South Africa. They did Nigeria. They did England, and I think Germany. But in Germany, um, Florence Kuyo, who plays Ayo, she's actually German. Um, and so she went there. It was, I think it was her and um, um, I have to look, look on their instance again. But I think it was her and um, 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 Okoye from, uh, yeah, from Walking Dead. The two of them were, the, were at, the, at the Berlin. And she was just there speaking her flawless German you know, with her bald head. And you know, it's like, again, it's like, oh my god, she's German. Right, and so all these little things are happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. Okay. Um, I mean, so cosmopolitanism is the idea that we are in that we are global citizens, right? That we are not that we shouldn't be defined only by citizenship and nation, but we should be defined in relation to everything else, right? Um, there are a lot of problems with the idea of uh, with, with with the ideas of cosmopolitanism, um, which we're not going to go into. Um, but I think that in his um, sort of globe trotting, right? Because I mean, like we meet Black Panther in Captain America: Civil War. He's in Europe. Then you know we see him again in Wakanda. Then he's in Korea to go get Claw. You know he'll be. You know he's going to be in the, in the next Avengers movie. You know so this sort of idea that like blackness is 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 global and it's not embedded in any one place, right? Um, and that blackness is capable in that world and has agency in that world and is not like um, you know agency and not just being passively like sort of you know, whipped here and there, right? Um, I th I think it's actually really really important. Um, one of the, so interestingly, one of the leading, and I forget his name, but one of the leading Korean models is he's half, half African, half Korean, right? And he's not in Black Panther at all, but there he was front and center when they had, the, when they had their, you know, the release party in Seoul, you know, South Korea, there he is, right? So I think, you know, this movie stitches those figures into the nation, um, but also into this cosmopolitan space in a way that I don't think it was possible before, to be honest. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.